Hi, friends. Welcome to the bunkhouse. Welcome to the Bunkhouse. We got a good show lined up for you. Well, stay with us. My special guest in the Bunkhouse today is Barry Corbin, great actor, master storyteller. And out at the wagon, Bill and Cliff are cooking brisket. Guarantee you, you're going to like it. Be sure you stay with us. I am so proud to have one of my very dear friends in the Bunkhouse with us today. A great actor, a horseman, and a very special person, Mr. Barry Corbin. Barry, I am so proud you joined us. Well, thank you, Red. It's good to be here. I, I enjoy doing your radio show, and now, you, now they can see us. Yes. They yeah. see what the bunkhouse looks like. And the boys. Yeah, isn't, this, isn't this pretty? Yeah, we're proud of it. Yeah. Uh, Barry, let's start off so that I can get an idea of what was the first role you landed Urban Cowboy, Uncle Bob, right? an Urban Cowboy. That was the first one. Before that, I'd done all stage work. I'd uh -huh. been writing plays. I'd been doing anything I could to get by. And uh, I got called in to Paramount, and uh, they had me read for them. And then a couple of weeks later, they called and said, I'd like, we'd like for you to come in and meet John, John Travolta. Mm -hmm. I went in and met him. We talked for a few minutes, and he said, we're going to have a lot of fun on this thing. And I said, oh, I guess we are. Nobody had hired me yet. <laughs> and then they said, well, do you want to go over to wardrobe and, and uh, trade in those old worn-out boots and that old worn-out hat for something to break them in? I said, all right. I thought, well, that's, that, that's what it is. They want my old worn-out boots and my old worn-out hat, and that's the last I'll hear from them. I got, went and got my boots, and my new boots, Tony Lama lizards, and a new hat. I thought, well, that's a good trade. Well, about uh, three or four days later, they called up and said, we're going to Houston on so-and-so date. I flew down to Houston, and I, and I asked my agent, I said, well, what, am I hired? And they said, yeah. And I said, well, and they told me what I was being paid, and I said, is that good? because I didn't know. And uh, they said, uh, well, no, but it's good for the first one. <laughs> and so I got, I got my money. And then I got there and they gave me a bunch of cash per diem. I thought that was it. I thought that's what I was being paid. So I lived on that and just sent the rest of it back to the bank, my salary. And when I got back to California, I bought a house. So that was my, <laughs> that was my first experience <laughs> with the movie. And then I got in... Uh, the best little whorehouse in Texas, and I got in uh, Any Which Way You Can, which were both hits about the same right. time. And I was playing a little different parts in, in all of them, so that kind of kicked me off. And from then on, for, for a while there, I was working a whole lot. And uh, it, uh, I, I've never slowed down a whole lot, but it's, uh, they're not doing many westerns anymore. What kind of experience was it? Uh being in Lonesome Dove? Oh, it was terrific. I got there in, uh, I think it was April. And uh, I was first, my scenes were the first one shot. So we did all that stuff in the woods and over at over mm -hmm. Willie's Town and all that stuff. Up until where the girl hits him with the rocks and, uh, and we hide and I meet up with July again. Then I, I was off. For, for like three months. I went and did three other movies. No kidding. Yeah. While they were going through all the, all the hard stuff, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, when I left, everybody was just as happy as they could be. And then I got back, and everybody was just as sore as a boil. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with anybody else. They were threatening to whip each other. <laughs> this was, uh, <laughs> this was in, in, in July, I think. So I'd been gone, and I... What in the world happened here? And then I realized, well, they went on a cattle drive. And, you know, if, if there's something that's going to uh, test your temper, 
It's it's being on a cattle drive, and they really were on one. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I got the best of the whole thing. You know, I, I didn't have to fool with that. I got to be, I got to just be stumbling around and, and gape mouth. You know, it was fun. <laughs> but you still do a lot of television, don't you? I do, I do, I do a lot of television. Uh, do a lot of these um, ultra low budget SAG movies. Which means I don't get paid anything, but I get fed. <laughs> and when they make money, if they do, now, now if, if four or five of these things hit, I'm set for life. But I, it's doubtful whether any of them will be seen <laughs> by anybody. <laughs> well, horses have been a big part of your life, Barry. And yes, I, sir. And we have been on a lot of different things together, horseback and, and with uh, major events and things like... Uh, Ben Johnson put us all together to begin with mm -hmm. and created a family for us with the ropings for uh, children's charities. Yeah, and we raised ben. a lot of money. Oh, I miss Ben. But uh, we're having a good time, and uh, I am so proud that you joined us in the bunkhouse. Well, I appreciate the whole experience. It's always good to see you, my friend. I like these fellas, too. These are good guys. Don't brag on them too much. Well, They're hard to handle. Don't want don't to give them the big head, I guess, but they are good fellas. <laughs> you folks stay with us. We'll be right back. Let's go out to the wagon and see what Cliff and Bill are cooking up. They told me earlier that it was custom designed for a hearty appetite. Oh, you're cooking brisket. Clifford, that's a real tough meat if you don't do it like you guys do it. And a brisket like this would probably take you about eight hours. Mm -hmm. uh, to cook, and it and what it does, it goes to breaking down and all this little extra fat that we have on here. We've trimmed up some of it because we don't need all that on there. But what that does, it just goes to going down through that meat and breaking it down, breaking it down. So it tenderizes that meat as you're cooking, just real slow. And, and how do you season it? Well, what we have is some more of our seasoning right here. Bill will get a little put on there. Do a coarse ground black pepper. We use a lot of pepper and all of them. We grind our own. The wind's still blowing. Yeah, it's a little blowing. wind there. Yeah. It always blows. <laughs> yeah. So this is ready to go to the smoker. That's ready to go yes. to the pit right well, now. Well, don't say smoker. We do it over live coal. Live oh, smoke. live coal. It's not really okay. smoking. It's, uh, well, we've got one that's already finished. Yeah, we got we one. We want to get that? Yeah, let's, we'll get that and out. show the folks what it looks and like when it's done. Folks. Okay. Oh, There's boy, that looks mighty go. good. And smells good. Thank you, Oh, I can't wait. Nice thing. Cut into that, Bill. Let's see what we got. Little, throw it up there and cut a little piece of it. You bet. Cut into it. We've got some sauce right here. This is called Grandpa making sauce. This is my granddad. This is his favorite recipe. It's, like it's in our book. Hand, we're gonna, that we're barbecue gonna biscuits and beans. Thing. It's called Grandpa Mickens barbecue sauce. Now, what's in your sauce? Well, this is a uh, little beef tallow that's melted down. Uh, we've got onions, lemons. Uh, Worcester mustard, but it's all in in that book. It's called Grandpa Mickens Barbecue Sauce. And I mean, it it does a number to it. So it's it's not really heavy sauce. It's, you can see how light it is, uh -huh. but it really it really has a good flavor to it. It's not the really heavy ketchup stuff like you see a lot of places. So Badger, I'm I'm going to do a poem that I wrote in 1990, and I kind of took it not from a real life experience, but from experiences that we all have had if we've ridden that river, and know that how tough that old quicksand is, and how we learned at an early age how to get out of it and let our horse have his head. It's called to an old friend. I stood by the fountain as they brought him out, a lost, lonely look on his face. I ain't never seen him in nothing but boots, in the wheelchair sure seemed out of place. It took him a while to recall who I am, then confusion broke into a grin. It was though we were saddled up, ready to ride the Hackberry pasture again. He laughed as he said, I remember the time that yeller bronc swallowed his head and pitched you so high that you turned over twice. Me and Benny Bob swore you was dead. He looked up at me and said, how is old Ben? I lied and said, he's doing fine. No need to remind him his brother was gone. Ben died back in 79. For most of an hour, we rode at a trot. 
We branded and shaped up the steers, drank gallons of coffee, ate sourdough bread, and cowboyed for 51 years. I thought he was an old man when I was a kid. At a time when I needed a friend, he took me to raise, taught me all that I know about horses and cattle and men. See, my daddy had died and I needed a job. I was big for a kid of 15. So they put me to work on the Four Sixes Ranch. I was dumb as a gourd and as green. We was looking for strays in the Wichita breaks. It was me and John Gaither and him. I'd lost sight of John. I was looking around kind of daydreaming there on the rim and rode up on some cattle hid out in the brush. A two-year-old steer come by me, throwed a nine in his tail and cut a new trail right out through them salt cedar trees. I lit out behind him a given her hell. This cold I was riding was green. I thought to myself, he ain't getting away. This roan is a running machine. We was going full bore when we got to the bank. Stream wasn't white as my hat. I almost pulled up, then I thought, the hell, I've jumped rivers wider than that. Well, I bogged that old pony plumb up to his gut. He was wallering and thrashing around, going down deeper with each desperate lunge and me praying he'd find solid ground. And just at the moment that I heard his voice, a rope appeared right by the roan. Get out of that cack and hang on to my line. The colt will get out on his own. I've crossed that old river many a time, found me a bog once or twice, but I still remember a 30-foot rope and a good cowboy piece of advice. When you ride the river, son, make sure your horse is gentle and seasoned as well, because only the good ones will get you across. That quicksand goes clean down to hell. I got up to leave and he reached for my hand. He said, son, I'm sure glad you dropped by. If you see old Ben, have him saddle my horse. I hate sitting waiting to die. His voice started cracking. He swallowed and said, I'm nearing the end of my ride. But if I cross the river before you get there, I'll leave a good horse on this side. Well, as my old daddy would say, we got this one saucered and blowed. It's time for us to ride on out of here. We got lots of work to do. And we'd like to thank you folks for joining us. Before we leave, I'd like to give you this little tidbit. The toughest part about not growing up on a farm or a ranch is that you have a tendency to believe that food comes from the grocery store and heat comes from the furnace. Aldo Leopold said that. But we're glad you joined us. We hope we taught you something about the cowboy you didn't know or maybe brought back an old memory. We would like to invite you to listen for us on Cowboy Corner on your local radio station and stop by your local newsstand and pick up the latest edition of Cowboys and Indians magazine, bringing you the beauty, the grandeur, and the drama of the American West. And Badger, and Dan, and Jake, and Leon, and I, would like to know for certain that you're going to join us right here in the bunkhouse same time next week. Adios, y'all.